saw them so few. I thought that was just so many. That was good. That was good. Yeah. That's what I would do. Yeah. Well, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Kevin Steinberg, Chief Operating Officer of the World Economic Forum USA. I oversee a number of our industry efforts within the World Economic Forum. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here with all of you this afternoon together with this distinguished panel. The panel on my left represents the chair people of our governors meetings. So those are our private meetings that take place within the World Economic Forum by industry sector, which later feed into not only the annual meeting, but a set of working groups, discussions, project, and ongoing efforts for our foundation to ensure that we collectively are addressing many of the issues that concern us most. This particular session, and this is the second year that we are holding these, is called our Global Industry Outlook. And the purpose is really twofold. The first is to take those meetings and go to the additional step of sharing the insights, the conclusions, and the real opportunities that have come from them to the broader Davos audience and to those of you who may be watching this from elsewhere by webcast or through other means, but also to start the dialogue between industries and between different parts of society so that we can collectively take those collective steps to improve the state of the world. We have five industries here and the five chair people from each of those industries. What I thought I would do to get us started is um, introduce them one by one and ask each of them to spend about three to five minutes highlighting some of the conclusions, some of the ideas, some of the insights, and some of the opportunities that came from those discussions, as well as what we can do going forward. I should mention just as a little bit of an overall thematic uh, observation. Last year when we had this session, there was a lot of talk of gloom and doom. People were very much talking about whether we were heading off a cliff. I'm happy to note that this year, there's a lot more productivity, there's a lot more uh, intent in all of these conversations to be proactive going forward. So if last year we were talking about whether it was the end of the world, this year it sounds like we've all agreed it's not the end of the world, so we're going to get together and talk about what we should do about that. So I'll introduce first to my left Joseph Ackerman from Deutsche Bank, who served as the chair of our financial services governors group. Joe, we'd welcome your thoughts. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We had a very interesting uh, governance meeting and we covered uh, more or less the following topics. Uh, first, uh, the economic uh, outlook. Secondly, the regulatory framework. Third, uh, the sustainability issues within the financial sector. And then we had the second part on risk management, which is actually very interesting because we compared risk management uh, lessons from other industries, the uh, aviation or, or, or uh, food industry and what, or insurance industry and what we could learn uh, in financial uh, sector or uh, above all in the, in the banking industry. Let, let me just say a few words about uh, what some of our uh, discussions uh, were. First of all, uh, we feel a little bit that, uh, especially in the political discussion, uh, seldom so few have done damage to so many, and that the many are taken as the few, in the sense that if you really boil it down to the nitty-gritty, uh, only a few banks have actually failed to test in this crisis. And the bulk of banks have managed the crisis astonishingly well and have increased their profitability and market share. So in that sense, uh, if we talk about lessons from the crisis, we should really single out those who have made major mistakes. Secondly, we also felt that a more differentiated analysis about the causes of the crisis uh, show that this is not only the bankers who made mistakes, but they are part of the blame. But of course, it's a pretty well balanced uh, situation between political failures, between market inefficiencies and banks' mistakes. And that's why we think we should now stop the blame game and we should start looking forward because at the end we need a strong financial sectors to cover the real issues which are ahead of us, namely unemployment. Just to mention two numbers, Spain has an unemployment number among the young people of 42%. The Middle East, over 50%. These are the real issues. Secondly, poverty, global imbalances, uh, many other things. And I think if you don't have a very strong financial sector to support this sort of recovery and to contribute 
to the prosperity and growth on a real, uh, in the real economy on a global scale, we are making a huge mistake and, and we will regret that later on. So we are saying that um, this forward-looking statement should also mean that we now pull our uh, forces together and say what should be done in order to make the system more stable, more resilient, without jeopardizing the efficiency of the market and the financing of the real economy. And there are a few things we would like to highlight. First of all, we very much support the reforms being taken on the regulatory side in terms of more capital, better liquidity management, uh, also in terms of improving the market infrastructure, uh, having a system in place which allows us to exit failed banks and not to have them jeopardize the stability of the system as a whole. But at the same time, we are saying we need consistent rules, we need global rules, and the fact how far we should go in the reforms should be based on a micro and macro impact study which shows what the impact on the real economy will be and what the impact on uh, uh, efficient and liquid markets will be. We don't think it's uh, very wise to come up with new ideas from wherever they are, new taxes, new proposals, because that is adding to the uncertainty and really slows down the process of uh, making the financial sector more stable. Having said that, we also know that uh, the regulators have done a tremendous job in advancing the regulatory work, but it's also fair to say that banks in the last two years, actually starting very early at the beginning of the crisis, have done a lot in improving their capital management, the liquidity management, the risk management, and also improving the market infrastructure. So all in all, I think uh, a lot has been done. Now, on the psychological uh, side and the political side, we agreed that we should become proactive, proactive in helping to put in place maybe insurance funds uh, on a national or a European level or even on a larger level to uh, also do something on the compensation issue. And this is, as we all know, a very emotional issue. We have changed the structure in compliance with the G20 rec uh, recommendations, but the quantum of compensation, of course, is still open, and, and we will work on that in the industry and see what kind of proposal we can make. Great, thank you, Joe. Uh, next to his left, we have Hans-Paul Brückner, who is the, uh, from the Boston Consulting Group and serve as the chair of our professional services group. If you can share some of the thoughts from that group's discussions, we would appreciate it. Yes, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the professional service firms, just to remind you, comprise the audit firms, the consulting firms, lawyers. Um, and um, you know, we, have, we are looking cautiously optimistic into 2010 and beyond. Um, there is a uh, you know, clear need to uh, continue to help uh, clients uh, through the crisis, out of the crisis, and we see uh, good signs uh, going forward. The bulk of our discussion centered around uh, our, what we see as our responsibility also to help uh, address the wider issue of uh, a more responsible capitalism. Because we clearly see the backlash um, against capitalism uh, in this crisis. We see a backlash against globalization in this crisis and we are very concerned that uh, this backlash will ultimately hurt um, the, uh, the global economy, the well-being of societies around the world. And so we were focusing on, on four elements of, of our action program. Uh, one was, of course, to, and to ensure that uh, value management is also seen as values management. And that we really see that if we take a long-term view in terms of uh, creating uh, value, uh, we'll also create jobs, we'll also uh, ensure that we uh, deliver to the needs of, um, of our uh, customers, customers of all uh, companies, uh, uh, that we deliver to uh, the needs of society. And, and so we, I think we need to want to reinforce this idea that value management is also values management. Uh, for us, as professional services companies, that means to reinforce also our code of conduct vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, our clients, our employees, um, the stakeholders in society and society at large. 
Secondly, uh, we feel it is important also to speak up, to speak up um, you know, in the public uh, to, uh, with our employees, with, uh, with students, uh, with politicians, um, with uh, uh, customers and, and companies around the world to reinforce the notion that the capitalist system has served as well, despite all the exuberance, the exaggerations, the fraud, that globalization is serving as well. And I think it's very important that we reinforce this, this message and that we, we speak up. Thirdly, uh, in the engagement, and professional service firms are engaged a lot with uh, public entities, um, to, and uh, uh, Joe talked about regulation, to ensure that uh, when we uh, work on new regulations that we're not going from one, maybe one extreme to another, but that we find a regulatory framework that is really beneficial, both addressing the risks that we have seen addressing the exaggerations, exuberance, the fraud that we have seen, but not making, not let, leading to a stifling of entrepreneurship, of business that ultimately will mean lower growth or no growth, uh, and therefore also continuous high unemployment or even increasing unemployment. So I think it's very important to make sure that we are not getting from one extreme to another, but find the right mechanism. And in our interaction with, uh, with governments, with uh, um, parliaments, um, uh, f helping them to find the right frameworks and also helping our uh, customers and clients to, to find the right framework. And lastly, we, uh, we said um, we are working on a, what we call a risk cockpit. Um, the different uh, professional service firms, uh, tax, consulting, um, audit, uh, lawyers and so forth, you know, are dealing with risks uh, and helping their clients deal with risk in a broad way. And so we will work on helping clients to really see the whole range of, of risk, different clusters, and uh, helping them to ensure that they look at all those uh, elements and not just have you know, risk in a specific uh, uh, sector very well covered and completely overlooking risks in other parts. So it's about people, it's of course it's about tax, it's about um, assets, it's about uh, you know, laws, uh, it's about strategic risk and so forth. And we will, over the next uh, few months, develop what we call a risk cockpit to, to help uh, clients and companies around the world to, to have at least greater transparency of what they need to, to deal with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Colin Dyer, who joins us from Jones Lang LaSalle, who served as the chair for our real estate governors group. Colin. I, thank you, Kevin. Um, to give you a feel for our uh, audience or our group, the uh, real estate group within the forum is composed mostly of people involved in construction, ownership, development of real estate. Uh, what's absent f uh, f for our, from our dialogues, but not from our thoughts, are the users of real estate. It's the corporations who uh, rent real estate for offices, logistics purposes, retailers, and so on. So that's the community. And to give you some background to our discussions, um, this is an industry, or this is a, uh, an asset class, which suffered uh, vertiginous declines in activity, in volumes of sales, and in price levels, asset price levels, between 2000 and beginning of 2008 and the middle of 2009. Order of magnitude prices of assets fell between 40 and 50 percent worldwide, and activity levels in terms of investment sales fell by 70 percent. Similar picture in the leasing market, where prices and activity levels fell by 40 percent. So a very cyclical industry. Um, the uh, p position that we found ourselves in, in Davos this time last year is we were right in the middle of that fall. Our sense at the moment is that the fall in asset prices and activity levels in investment sales is stabilizing, and there is a gradual uh, forming of a bottom and a recovery in both pricing and activity, starting in the East, very clearly driven by Chinese liquidity, uh, but also more broadly based across Asian economies, and it's moving uh, westwards to Europe, surprisingly, and last in line is the US and the North American continent in general. So that's the context in which we uh, deal, uh, we were looking at the world, where investment sales are clearly anticipating, as the stock, market anticip the stock market has anticipated recovery in the broader economy, uh, investment sales activities are uh, anticipating recovery in the broader demand for real estate. So in that, against that background, looking forward and thinking about the things which were preoccupying us, um, several of these factors were sort of external to our industry. Obviously, primary, the primary factor is the trajectory of worldwide growth, because that drives the fundamental demand for space 
in real estate. But closely linked to that are some of the subjects which Chair Ackerman has been uh, referring to this afternoon. Um, the financial sector, we rely heavily on the financial sector, sector to structure the deals which provide the liquidity, which provide the, the velocity of transactions in the real estate area and indeed support values of holdings of real estate. And until our sense is that until, until the uh, regulators have sorted out how the general financial industry is to be regulated, and our sense is it's not just the banking sector, but it's, it's broader than banks. But until that's sorted out, then we will continue to find bankers who are reluctant, hesitant to lend into the real estate sector, indeed to any sectors, but particularly in, in real estate. Those same banks have a portfolio of non-performing loans, some much worse than others. So far, um, because the government support for the banking system worldwide has been extremely uh, robust, they have, in general, the banking system has not in general had to do what it's done in previous cycles, which is push those non-performing loans or the underlying assets into the market. But at some point in the, in, in the next year, 18 months, that trickle will, will become more of a stream. So that impacts our forward thinking as well. Uh, central bank policy towards availability of credit and interest rates, it's all part of this external package which impacts our industry and provides a lot of the cyclicality to real estate. The final point is um, about sustainability. Um, real estate uh, in general is responsible for 40% of the world's carbon footprint. The real estate sector is tw uh, prov uh, provides twice the carbon output of uh, airplanes and automobiles put together. And so whether we like it or not, this is a big issue for the real estate sector. Uh, gradually, the users of real estate corporations and the constructors and builders and owners of real estate are understanding that there is value to be gained or destroyed by having buildings which are efficient or inefficient in an energy and sustainability sense. And so that's beginning to become a major agenda item for the sector as a whole and indeed for the forum where we're putting uh, work into the Slim Cities initiative of the forum. But what's also clearly coming down the road towards us is government regulations, because governments at all levels and in most continents are now taking interest in regulating not only the construction standards, but the standards of, of, of energy performance in existing real estate stock. So that summarizes the broad sweep of our discussions. Great, thank you. Next, we have Eric Mindich, who joins us from Eden Park Capital Management, representing our investor sector. Eric. Good afternoon, thank you. Um, so our, our group, which, which represented um, some leading uh, private equity fund managers and hedge fund managers, uh, had, had a discussion that had as its backdrop an understanding that we were operating in a world where the relationship between uh, our industry and various stakeholders was changing and the uh, perception um, was, was changing in some cases very rapidly. And it's against a backdrop where financial markets themselves are coming under question as to whether they're the best allocator of resources and therefore participants within those financial markets um, are, are also facing a similar set of questions. There was a recognition that perhaps our industry had not communicated as well as it could have, um, as well as it could with its various stakeholders and with the public in order to in some ways articulate better what it is we do, what our role is and kind of how we participated in, in, in um, uh, throughout, throughout the last several years. In the, in the private equity world, I think there was you know, th there's a feeling that, that private equity firms have contributed significantly to uh, growth capital and to efficiencies within, within corporations. Within the hedge fund world, there is a feeling that, generally speaking, in addition to hedge funds not having been kind of central to the, you know, to the financial crisis, there's also the view that largely they had fulfilled their mission to investors in terms of delivering uh, absolute returns um, and that their investors themselves were pension funds, you know, and foundations, endowments, all sorts of, um, of, uh, of types of investors like that. And also um, that the role and functioning within the capital markets themselves and how important that is to the efficient allocation of resources was probably also not sufficiently explained. And so there was, there was discussion about how we could articulate that better um, and what kind of outreach we, we could have with various stakeholders. There was discussion about the political environment surrounding, uh, 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 the political environment surrounding all this. Um, and again, the anxiety that kind of in the uh, push to, um, you know, to kind of have solutions, particularly broader financial services reform, to make sure that things were done in, a, in as thoughtful a way as could be done and avoiding whatever unintended consequences uh, there, there, there might be, which could have long-lasting impacts. There was also discussion about the nature of our relationships with our limited partners, with our investors. 
Um, there's, there's been an increasing push towards, um, you know, I guess the phrase is alignment of interests, which, which relates to a whole series of, of, of factors. And the hedge funds and private equity fund in, uh, groups um, themselves and individually have been uh, pushing, um, as, as have clients, in order to kind of harmonize that to, to, to a greater extent. There's also discussion about the availability of leverage and credit in the, in the private equity world. Um, you know, uh, because leverage is less available, that's pushing firms more towards growth equity types, types of investing, less leverage deals. It also means significantly less purchasing power for private equity firms going forward. And for hedge funds, there was an understanding um, that, you know, that the relationship between their credit providers, which were the banks and hedge funds, has in some ways changed. Historically, it had been the banks that were uh, fearful of credit issues from hedge funds, and then it became hedge funds being fearful of credit issues with, with, with banks, and that's an issue that's still being worked through, and kind of harmonizing all of the availability of credit were important things as well. Great, thank you. Our final panelist is Jeff Zucker from NBC Universal, representing the media, entertainment, and information sector. Jeff. So thank you very much, and, and good afternoon, everybody. I would say in, in, in our group, uh, if a year ago the feeling was that we were at, at the end of the world and on the precipice, I think the, the, the mood in our group was much better this year uh, with a belief that the uh, economy uh, will will treat media better this year. The economy will rebound. Advertising will rebound, and that the uh, that both old media and new media um, will benefit from that and have a much better year this year. Our group was comprised of of, of actually uh, probably more new media than it was old media, and I think that's a, uh, a a tribute to what's going on in media today and what defines media. I think that also led to the biggest topic within our group. Uh, which was really how do you define new economic models within media and how do you um, find economic models that will allow old media companies to uh, survive and allow new media companies to thrive. And I would say that there is still no, uh, uh, no answer to that question and I think that's the thing that will, will uh, roil the entire media industry, both old and new, uh, in the next year, two or three ahead. So a lot of, a lot of discussion around uh, uh, monetizing uh, new media, uh, how do old media companies change their models uh, under the pressure of, of new, model, uh, new media companies, um, and no clear answers uh, on any of that. I'd say we also spent a lot of time talking about uh, personal and corporate reputations in this era of, of social networks and instant communication and, and what the role of media is with regard to that. Uh, and the responsibility both on the, the media side and how individuals and corporations respond uh, to those attacks, uh, to the coverage, um, to that new world order. Uh, we had a fascinating discussion with the president of Iceland who obviously uh, went through a tremendous uh, experience last year, uh, near-death experience in, with, with the financial meltdown. And he was uh, fascinating on uh, the fact that uh, the, the media had declared his country financially bankrupt uh, and it had spread within a day and had done tremendous damage to both his country and to himself. And the question is, how do you, you know, what responsibility did the media have and how did he personally respond? Uh, and you know, in the end, well, one of his answers was that he decided that he, he just wasn't going to respond and whether or not that was the right way uh, to deal with, with these issues. So that, that was, uh, I think, something that we all face both personally and, and on a corporate level. Another, another area uh, that we spent a lot of time on was privacy and the lawful, uh, lawful exploitation of data uh, that we all get uh, in this era and whether or not uh, privacy existed anymore or would exist or could exist uh, in, in, uh, from the media and on a personal level and what the responsibility w there was. And I think it was, uh, there's clearly no answer on this question. Um, what the role of uh, all of us is in deciding uh, how much to uh, reveal and how much to exploit uh, is, is something that we're all grappling with, both old media, new media, uh, and, and governments alike. And so that's something um, that I think we'll also face in the years to come. And then finally, we, uh, we spent time uh, on an issue that has been very important to us and that I think should be important to everybody here, and that was piracy. Uh, and the role that uh, protecting our intellectual property has, uh, whether you're new media, whether you're old media, uh, or whether you're anybody represented on this panel here, that really is an uh, issue of economics uh, uh, and, um, and jobs uh, and something that uh, we think that everybody has a vested interest in and that, that we all have to play a role in and that governments have to play a role in uh, and, and something that probably has garnered more attention than it had 
but still not enough. Thank you. Well, let me begin perhaps by weaving together two of the themes that I think have come up in almost all of your comments. One is almost all of you have touched on the role of government in reform and much of the processes that are taking place. And several of you touched on communication and the fact that perhaps the industry or many companies need to be more proactive. Let me pose to the group, in light of the experience we just heard with Iceland and how the media can have that effect of broadcasting messages so quickly, did any of you discuss in more detail what your industries could do to be more proactive on that front? How to better get that message out? How to communicate, given that the cycle has become so short that the questions about reform and government have now become more closely linked to questions about communication? Would anyone like to start with uh, Well, I think it's comment? not an issue of uh, you know, having one key uh, message or one uh, key channel, but it is uh, really talking uh, with, uh, through different channels, uh, through different audiences, um, and to make your voice heard. It is certainly not sufficient to leave uh, uh, the, uh, the forums to, uh, uh, to one group only, but to really have a multitude of voices and to make sure that uh, you bring across um, key messages. Uh, at the moment, I mean, we talk a lot about, um, you know, uh, somebody has to pay a price or has to be penal penalized for what has happened. Um, and, uh, and it's very difficult to, to make people understand that we all are linked together. And I think by, uh, by going maybe from one extreme to another, in the end, everybody will, will, will be hurt. And I think making sure that these messages come across continuously uh, is important rather than saying, you know, let's withdraw and let's not talk. I think more communication is better than, than, uh, than less communication. Does anyone want to comment on some of the key messages that would be effective? I think there's been a lot of consensus that effective communication is helpful. I know some of the groups talked about some of the messages they would like to highlight. Uh, would anyone like to address that? Perhaps Joe? Well, I would, uh, one, one word to the communication. I mean, first of all, uh, I mean, we discussed that, that we should be better aligned. But uh, as a matter of fact, we are not a homogeneous group. We, have, uh, we are in a competitive environment. That's probably not bad with different uh, interests, also in terms of regulation. But what, what is important is uh, that uh, we are reaching out to politicians, to regulators first, in, in a maybe somewhat off the record, because very often, uh, and, and I'm not critical of media at all, but, but uh, half a sentence is then on screen within seconds and may provoke a reaction, which may be not quite the right one, because if you take the whole uh, message and statement, you will come to different conclusions. So in that sense, and I really have to say that in the last two days, I'm, I was very much uh, relieved about the constructive attitude of a lot of people where we have communicated via the, the media in a somewhat, I wouldn't say hostile, but not very constructive way. And if you sit together, you explain your, your, your points, your elements, and, 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 and you listen to the other arguments, uh, then of course you find much better ways. Someone said, that we may have to create, and I'm just saying this one ID, from a G20, a B20, so business 20, because it is not only uh, to defend your own interests or to talk about your own industry. It's very important to demonstrate that they are negative or positive impact on other industries. We just heard it. Real estate is a question of also funding. And, and for instance, uh, in order to be constructive here, we cannot just do it via, via the lending market, we have to reactivate the securitization market. So there is a common interest, and the same is true for all the other statements. In that sense, I think we have to join forces more often, and, and in that sense, the interdisciplinary approach we are enjoying here and cultivating in Davos is probably the right approach. I think that, that's the, uh, very nicely put, because our concern is that if, if politics is the driver of bad regulation, and in doing that, the emotive sector of the banks is the sector that's attacked, whilst the securitization or the hedge fund market, which is equally capable of causing a lot of damage in the future, if the issues, potential issues in that market are not addressed at the same time, then we as real estate uh, professionals are going to find ourselves, we are not served by a financial services industry which allows huge booms in asset prices um, corrected by huge busts because the, the regulatory environment 
is not satisfactory. So I think I mean, that's our concern, the communication issue, to go back to that. Um, unfortunately, the, emotive, the emotions are on the side of, of hitting the banking industry in a rather indiscriminate way. And whether it's natural to the banking industry or not, it feels like it's an occasion where there has to be some really strong and proactive communication to counter that. You know, you, because if you don't fight blow with counter blow, then the first blow becomes the, the truth, unfortunately. No, Jeff, perhaps if I, if I could ask, uh, in light of this stress on communication, you mentioned that perhaps for the first time, the new media voices in this governor's meeting were uh, getting larger, perhaps even outweighing some of the older media. How does that change this equation? Any thoughts in terms of, given these new outlets, these new ways to communicate, how some of these other industries or how business in general should be mindful of how they could be affected in this well, regard? I, I, I'm not, I don't want to necessarily give any advice that anybody should take uh, to the bank, but um, I, I, I would say that I think we have to all be uh, uh, just conscious of the fact that we are in an entirely new world. You know, it, it used to be a, uh, uh, we would wait for the newspaper to come out tomorrow, uh, and then we would wait for, uh, you know, the, the news programs tonight. Um, waiting five minutes today is not even possible. Uh, we live in a, in a society where it's uh, news and information, it's not even news often, is measured in seconds. And I think this is both an opportunity for everybody here uh, and something that we can't uh, ignore. Uh, it, can be, it can be personally and corporately uh, problematic and it can also be used to great effect. So I think that uh, old ways of dealing with media uh, are not sufficient anymore. Um, but I think that uh, embracing the new methods that can uh, also help um, uh, are important for, for each of us. And um, I don't think you can ignore it. You ignore it at your own peril. Great. Well, look, I'd like to turn to the audience who uh, give an opportunity for questions. What I'll ask everybody is we're going to pass around a microphone. If you could hold off until the microphone comes to you, please give your name and the name of your organization. If you have anyone in mind in particular where you'd like to direct the question, please feel free to say so and uh, we'll take questions from as many as we can fit in over the next uh, 25 minutes or so. So if anyone could just raise their hand if you'd like to ask the first question. I know this isn't a shy group, so I'll uh, look to the audience to get us going. There's one right over here, please. My name is Barry Gossin. I'm CEO of Newmark Knight Franco Real Estate Firm. Uh, Joseph, you talked about the, uh, reactivating the securitization market. I mean, right now, the balance sheets of many banks are clogged up with uh, assets and uh, in, in the continued deleveraging, it makes it hard to, uh, to put more, more loans out to real estate. It's a, uh, at the height of the market, 75% of the, the, the loans were securitization. So in order to have a healthy real estate market and to, to start moving it from the bottom, we are gonna need a securitization market in order to get things going. How do you think, what, what do you think it's going to look like? How do you think it's going to get done? And uh, what's the likelihood of the securitization mark, market getting reactivated? Well, first, first of all, I think it's an absolute uh, crucial uh, development. If people assume that we can move back from a market-based system to a bank-based system and taking all the exposures on the balance sheet, then they are absolutely mistaken. That's not going to happen. We will not be able to finance uh, real estate. The securitization market uh, has started, uh, but we will need with simple products, more transparent products. We will have to give more information on the products in, in the course of the, of the transaction. And of course, uh, one of the big questions is we need the investors. And we are always talking about banks. We also need investors, and investors probably have one response, the price has to be right. And, and sometimes uh, for more complex products, uh, uh, investors feel that the price level is not yet where they would like to see it. And, and I think we will have to find this equilibrium before we really move. In addition, we have to do everything on the regulatory side that we are not um, making it more difficult that uh, uh, banks are willing to play that role as uh, as a market maker in the securitization market. And, and in that sense, uh, capital requirements play an important role, will be part of the impact studies which we are doing right now in the industry under the leadership of the 
of course, of the uh, Basel Committee, but that is a very important element, and, and we shall see what the outcome of this impact will be in terms of uh, securitization. But it is absolutely essential that not only for real estate, for many other areas, that we reactivate uh, the uh, securitization market. Eric, did you perhaps want to add from an investor perspective what some of your considerations are? Sure. Well, first, first, I certainly agree that restarting the securitization market is essential. A significant part of bank lending was always meant to be originated and sold into the securitization market, and, and being unable to offload that into the securitization market has been one of the reasons why it's been more difficult for kind of new issue lending to happen. I, th I think that there, that, there are, um, that, that there are a number of issues. I, I, I think one has to do with um, either is, um, as was mentioned, either providing a lot more information, which even having provided that, makes it difficult for, there aren't that many investors who are well situated to analyze all that information. Yeah, historically, that, that had been intermediated by the rating agencies, and given the issues with, with rating agencies over this last period of time, th there's either a higher discount rate that's going to be associated with that, or I think more likely, in the short term, the types of pieces that will be sold into the market will be the much more senior, much more secure pieces, stuff that looks more like the AAA. That's what will start out initially. It will undoubtedly be at wider spreads than had been during the, uh, during, during the boom. And over time, as people get comfortable with the AAA piece, get comfortable with doing the uh, underlying research on that, as rating agencies kind of continue to kind of uh, rebuild their, their credibility or other models kind of develop, you, you'll be able to get lower uh, into, you know, kind of, kind of into the stack. Um, but, um, but, but, but I do think that the pricing is going to have to be right, and certainly the pricing that we saw uh, during, during the boom was a result not just of the of, um, of kind of uh, appetite from, uh, from investors, but also the very high leverage that was available against those, um, you know, against those securitization assets themselves, as well as the regulatory framework that kind of allowed that those AAA assets have virtually no capital charge associated with them. So with those factors having changed, even when the securitization market comes back, it'll undoubtedly be, I imagine it'll be at wider spreads and lower loan to values. Thank you. There was a question over here in the back on my right. I'm Alfred Berkeley, and I'm making this comment in my role as chairman of XBRL US, which is the <coughs> uh, uh, nonprofit that's been setting data standards for the SEC. On the um, restarting of securitization, the pricing issue that you mentioned, Mr. Zucker, is exactly the heart of it. And at this very minute in Washington, uh, there is a, an effort to bring substantially more transparency into these, secure, into these securitized uh, packages using the technology that the SEC is installing in the Edgar system. The, uh, the technology uh, is there, it works. The first 400 American companies are using it now. The next 1,000 start th this June. All companies are required to use it next June. And uh, that the discussions going on this morning uh, at the right agencies uh, who hold a lot of these securities is all about how to bring the kind of transparency that the Securities Act of, in, of 30, Securities Exchange Act of 34 brought and that whole composite of legislation that brought so much transparency to equities. Equities didn't fail in this last cycle. It was the unregulated or opaque securities that were hard to price. So the, the point, uh, with that background, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Ackerman, whether or not the banks in Europe are doing anything about bringing transparency as a logical way of uh, g giving healthier markets rather than more micromanagement. Well, I think we forgot to mention one important element, that's the quality of the underlying assets. I mean, people are now burnt their fingers and they will watch the quality of the underlying assets much more carefully. But yes, European banks are working on transparency, on standardization, and, and if you have seen the more recent uh, transactions, I think you have seen uh, much more information, and, and people are certainly encouraged to rely less on, on, on ratings, and, and, uh, but uh, we need the, the right price level and the right quality of underlying assets, and we need the simplicity of products in order to regain trust into the securitization market, and it's at the end all a question of trust. There's a question here in the front row on my left. Hi, my name is Yassad Jarrar. I'm from uh, the uh, Young Global Leaders Group. Uh, just to take this discussion to a bit of a more organizational level, I think the idea uh, of the, we've been discussing a lot about regulation, 
And what happened in the past is we had regulated the products and we had some regulation. There was some over-innovation. Some people talk about over-innovation from the extremely clever people that work with us for organizations that uh, caused some of these issues. Uh, how much are we going to, and, and the new regulation as well, might, might, some people might find some clever ways as well of, of uh, getting around some. How much are we going to see some internal risk management practices coming up in the organizations? Uh, very solid risk management practices that will, will, will not be easy to do, that will be very expensive, where things will be the checks and balances internally will actually allow us to make some of these decisions without the big brother's sort of uh, regulation. Uh, and uh, is this something that organizations are looking at from a professional services firm? You mentioned, you mentioned something on that. Because the, the concern is not how much can we regulate from the umbrella? And is that going to stifle competition if we overdo it with the knee-jerk reactions? Yeah. And should it become in mo much more internal than actually external? Well, I mean, certainly the, the uh, implementation of uh, uh, risk management systems has to be reinforced. But I think the failure of the last several years has not necessarily been the lack of risk management systems. In many institutions, there were, uh, you know, well-defined, uh, very sophisticated systems. They were very often ignored. The decisions was made, you know, despite the system saying, you know, this is too much of a risk, you know, we'll do take it because it looks so profitable. And, of course, um, you know, Joe talked about understanding the underlying asset. And I think even in many institutions who are dealing with, uh, with certain securities, very sophisticated or, uh, constructions, they did not understand what they were dealing with. So I think one of the key elements is to make sure that it's not just the systems are there, but the systems are being applied and adhered to. Um, and you're right, of course, you know, you know, no regulation will ever prevent people from doing uh, stupid things. But it's the important thing to ensure that within the banks, within companies in general, uh, people do uh, use their systems and make the right decisions based on also what the systems suggest them. And ultimately, it's the, the uh, risk-taking appetite that, that decides and whether people also understand what they're dealing with. Eric, did you want to comment? I'll come to Joe next. No, I was just, I was just going to add that risk management systems are obviously incredibly important, and I'm sure all over, all over uh, the financial sector those are being improved. But, but ultimately, it's about judgment, um, and you need to have people in place who are exercising really good judgment. I think, I think essentially most of the folks that got in trouble didn't think they were taking a lot of risk. It was precisely because they were buying securities that were AAA that the, that the regulations said were safe and had very low capital charges associated with them, and all throughout the system, people view those as very low risk. That's why they could take such disproportionately large positions that ultimately were, were, were in difficulty. So I think the systems are certainly important, but if we don't have people in there, you know, using and exercising that really good judgment, you know, you, you can have all the systems you want, that's not going to solve the problem. But is that, um, <clears throat> just to challenge that point, I mean, the, AAA, the, the performance of AAA-rated securities through all of the crisis has remained pretty good. In other words, they were, they were AAA for a reason. They were better than the AA and, and lower grades. So when people bought AAA, they were not seeking so much risk as those who were buying the lesser graded securities. Weren't the people seeking risk those that went further you know, up the risk curve and bought lower quality securities? Well, I would say, I would say there's no doubt that the AAAs perform better than the lower rated instruments. But overwhelmingly, the AAAs did not perform according to what AAAs were meant to. And so, you know, the folks that owned the equity part of a securitization knew they were taking equity risk. So they sized it, hedged it, did whatever they were supposed to do in proportion to that. The folks that owned the AAA risk were able to do tens of billions of dollars of it without thinking it needed either a hedge or a sufficient capital cushion to it. So I, I really think it was, I mean, it was all throughout the system, but it was really the most highly rated in, uh, things that really failed. And, and then, um, and, and, I, and there are like lots of examples of AAA securities that have done really poorly. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Across all asset classes. Across enough asset classes to right. call into question whether that AAA was really good. Right. Yeah. You. Comment from Joe, and then we'll turn yeah. over here in front of me. But Joe. Well, I think it's a very important uh, question. If you analyze those banks who did badly during the crisis, um, it is actually not that much lack of the regulatory framework. It's much more bad management, bad risk management, lack of discipline, lack of acquisition discipline, and I would even add lack of uh, qualified supervision. And, and in that sense, risk management has become a very, very important element of uh, an improved banking system. And the 
Bankers Association, the Institute of International Finance, has published a best practice recommendation on risk management already two or three years ago. So in that sense, we are fully aware of that. Now, you know, we, we learned some lessons. I mean, one was the what is price, market price, and what is intrinsic value. Uh, my favorite example is always the student loan portfolio, which was down to 35. Uh, although I don't think 65% of students are not going to pay back their loans. Now it's up to 75 or 80 again. So is the quality so different from, from the market prices? Secondly, uh, what we have clearly underestimated in a globalized, securitized, and I always like to add atomized with millions of investors uh, world, that uh, we do see completely different uh, risk uh, uh, developments. For instance, the subprime, many of us have recognized that subprime is a problem. But no one, or almost no one, has anticipated that this will lead to the same impact on all other asset classes and correlation uh, approaches one. And that is something, a complete trying up of liquidity in a market and of demand for not only one product, subprime, but for leverage loans, for, for commercial real estate, you name it. And I think that is something we have to approach risk management in a much more holistic uh, method than we did in the past. And, and these are lessons we learned. And that regulation will not replace good risk management. Great. There was a question right over here in front of me. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Praveen Nair from New York University. I have a question on a completely different topic, and it's for uh, Jeff in particular. Um, you talked about changes in the channel of communication, and certainly there is a change in the um, amount of information coming everyone's way. Uh, but there's a lot of information coming into companies. And so we heard a lot about how companies should communicate back to their constituencies, but the constituencies are communicating back to companies. And my experience has been that the companies are not very good at listening and then responding to their constituencies. So the flood of information that's coming to them via email, et cetera, and, and you were kind of in the middle of that not too long ago, you kind of know how that went. And so um, can the media companies perhaps uh, help in dealing with this flood of information coming into companies uh, and not just the other way around? Well, I, I think that, I think media companies can certainly play a role in that, but I think the big difference today is that media companies don't control all that information that's coming in. And, and that's where you have to make a decision on what's important and what's valuable. The fact is this is the, this is the age of information that is controlled you know, by the individual. And so all of our companies are being flooded with feedback, information, instant communication, uh, instant feedback on how we're all doing, uh, how we're perceived. And I don't think it's just, to, uh, just left to the media companies to um, make a determination as to what's important and what's valuable. I think that's the old way that it was always done. You know, I think certainly if I look at my company, what we bring to the, what we bring to the equation is the credibility uh, that each of our brands has in, in in sifting through information and putting our uh, uh, putting out or reporting what we think is is correct, what is important, what companies people need to know, I think that's the value we bring to it. But I think that that ignores an entire uh, new world where, you know, today everybody's a journalist uh, because they have a blog, uh, and you know today uh, we write the story and maybe we'll ask the questions later. You know, it used to be that we'd ask the questions and then write the story. So we can't pretend that, that that doesn't exist. And so I think all companies and all industries have to recognize that there's credibility that comes from brands that <coughs> sift through and dissem disseminate information, but, inf but, uh, but there's feedback and instant feedback and instant communication that comes from every individual in the world. And you have to make a determination as to uh, on your own level, what's important and what you're going to deal with. Let me turn to the floor for another question. If there's anything else that I'd like to add, and, I mean, perhaps I'll make one, one sort of add one question as well. We talked a little bit about information empowering the consumer. I know a number of your groups have touched on changing consumer behavior and preferences and how that may impact a lot of your industries. Perhaps I'll turn to Colin and ask. I know there was some question about new consumers demanding 
environmental aspects of building, construction and real estate, and that's impacting how many of the people in the sector are thinking about construction and other factors. So I wonder if you can comment on some of those discussion, perhaps tied to the fact you mentioned earlier that 40% of emissions are tied to real estate and buildings. Um, yes, and this has come to the real estate industry from, in a similar way to the way you described it, the employees of large companies have increasingly become aware en masse of the issues of the environment and, and climate change. And they look, all, they look around them and every aspect of what they do, from their cars to the way they um, heat their homes or light their homes, um, are, are seen as potential areas that they can contribute. And when it comes to their working environment, what we're seeing more and more, particularly in progressive organizations, is that their employees um, who've been through an education system where they've been taught by teachers who were very environmentally aware for the last 10 to 15 years, um, those kids are arriving in the workforce and they are demanding that their employers pay attention to the whole climate change issue. Um, employers have started to listen, and as I described earlier on, it, the process started with the corporate users of real estate, and surprise, surprise, the owners of real estate are starting to listen to what they've worked out of their customers, which are the corporations. Um, some companies have taken uh, a lead in reacting to this, and I have to say Deutsche Bank is one of them, and is very progressive in this area. Uh, I suspect partly because their customers find it attractive as well to work in branches which are, to visit branches which are environmentally uh, responsible. So that's where the, the, the source of the, of the um, push has come from. Great. I see we have almost no time left. I thought perhaps I'd turn to the panel, give each of you perhaps uh, you know, 30 seconds or a minute for any final comments or highlights that haven't come up, and then I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up. So I'll move down the row. If, Joe, you had anything to add first. Well, I'm, I'm sometimes asked whether we are more pessimistic than a year ago, and for our industry, certainly not the case. We were close to a meltdown last year, but we still see a lot of risk on the horizon, sovereign risk, asset inflation, uh, uh, commercial real estate in some parts of the world, uh, increasing uh, default rates in, in, in corporate sector and private sector. So in that sense, there was a confidence that we are uh, seeing having the worst behind us, but still somewhat fragile in, in, in terms of uh, the economic environment. Great. Well, I think the professional services firms are particularly keen in, in pushing the idea that globalization really benefits everybody. I think we need to be very careful that we're not just focusing on the needs in, of, of uh, people in Europe, North America, maybe Japan, the developed world, but also really make sure that globalization continues because it has raised the standard of living uh, across the world. And uh, I think uh, with the uh, economic crisis has certainly exacerbated the discussion around globalization and is it good or is it bad? It is good, it has benefited all of us and I think we need to continue to push that and make sure that we continue on that path rather than going back because it will, it will really uh, hurt us all. Um, I'd echo both of those sentiments. It, everyone feels a whole lot better this year than they did last year and the general sentiment is we'll feel even better in 2011. Um, and despite the short-term cha challenges which, which we've described around financing in, in, in the industry as a whole, the sense is that the longer-term trends in real estate, and in a cyclical industry you have to keep your eyes on those, those are intact and they are very much coming back into people's thoughts. They are the globalization of real estate, complicated subject, you can ask, ask me about it afterwards. The fact that sustainability is rising up every, every, everybody's agenda and staying there through good and bad parts of the, of the crisis, and the increasing a view of institutions of real estate as a long-term investable asset class. All of those long-term trends are intact and we're back on those courses. I think, I think we covered it. I, I, I think um, rather than describing it as a sense of optimism, I would describe it as kind of a sense of back to, be, you know, back to being in business and doing, you know, and kind of doing the normal day-to-day -day business that you, uh, that, that you need to do. And I think hoping about the, about the economy, but also watching, you know, having a very watchful eye on some of the risks out there. I'd say technology is changing uh, the way we all communicate, the way that media uh, uh, collects and disseminates information, that we're all, in, uh, we're all involved in that. Uh, and this is both an incredibly exciting and dynamic time for media throughout the world and an, an incredibly empowering time for individuals. And the key is to know uh, how to deal with that and how to embrace it and to know what's, uh, uh, what's right, what's wrong. Um, but it's never been more exciting and never been more empowering to the, uh, uh, to the whole world uh, than it is today. 
Great. Well, since we're ending on an optimistic note, let me wish you my thanks for joining us here today, a, an invitation to join us once again next year, when I hope it'll be even more optimistic. And please join me in thanking our panelists for their insightful comments. Thank you very much.